I have very fond memories of uh, getting astronaut ice cream when my parents would take me to a museum when I was a kid. So I decided to uh, try to recreate the experience here in the home shop by making my own astronaut ice cream. So let's uh, see how it came out. It's just like how I remember it. Let me show you how I did this. Astronaut ice cream is just normal ice cream that has been freeze-dried. And so the process of freeze drying allows us to remove water without letting the water uh, melt first. So in this case, the water goes straight from ice, a solid, to vapor. And by doing this, the structure of the ice cream is preserved. So if you took some ice cream out of the freezer and just let it sit on the counter, eventually it would melt into a puddle. And if you kept waiting, eventually all the water would ev evaporate away and you'd be left with sort of a sludge. So the sludge doesn't resemble the original ice cream because uh, the structure is missing. Ice cream has a lot of air whipped up into it, and so to preserve that porous, airy structure, it's necessary to get the water out without letting it melt. So lucky for us, water has a property that will allow us to get the uh, water out without letting it melt, and this is called sublimation. So by lowering the pressure on the piece of ice cream, we can get the water to go straight from solid to gas. So this is how a freeze dryer is basically built. We have the chamber here, and I'll get into the exact temperature that we're going to use, where you put your food. And then this is called a cold trap. So this is just a section of, of line that is held at a lower temperature than the chamber. So in this case, I was using dry ice and ethanol just as a, a bath to transfer the heat uh, to the tube. And this is at negative 70 C about for dry ice. And then there's a vacuum pump that will lower the pressure in the whole system and allow this to work. So what happens is when the vacuum pump is turned on, the pressure is lowered and the water will start to sublimate out of the ice cream and travel through the tube and actually get stuck here. And the reason it gets stuck here is because it's uh, much colder in the cold trap than it is in the chamber. And for a given pressure, the water will sublimate here and then re-solidify here. So we end up with, with the water being sucked out of the ice cream and transferred into this cold trap. And then when the process is over, you can empty the cold trap out, which is going to be filled with water or ice, and the product will be dry. So I started with a Harbor Freight 3 CFM vacuum pump. CFM is cubic feet per minute. This is the biggest one that they sell, as far as I know. And I modified it by taking off the fitting that was originally there for air conditioning service. This pump was meant to um, uh, evacuate the air conditioning system in your car or house, and replaced it with a much larger hose fitting. Uh, the reason for doing this is that at low pressures, uh, the pressures necessary to sublimate water, the flow through a really thin hose is actually quite poor. Uh, it seems a little counterintuitive, but at really low pressures, at vacuums, at high vacuums, the tubing actually needs to be larger to allow those gas molecules and water molecules to flow through there. Uh, the pressure is so low that there isn't enough force to, to push the fluid through the hose. So it's necessary to, uh, to use a, a large diameter. Uh, so the next piece I built was this cold trap, which is a piece of copper pipe uh, and some standard pipe fittings that I just you know, cut and uh, sweated together, a standard solder. And they are sitting in a thermos, a stainless steel thermos that I filled with ethanol and dry ice. So this is a good way. It's a, uh, if you don't need liquid nitrogen temperatures, a dry ice ethanol bath is, is a good alternative because it's a lot cheaper and easier to uh, maintain. You can get dry ice at Safeway, which is what I usually do. They're open late at night and you can get dry ice <laughs> any time of day or night. For the chamber, I used a glass uh, Erlenmeyer flask. And the reason I did this was so that I could keep an eye on the sample. My first, I actually had a previous attempt at doing this, and I used a stainless steel dehydration chamber or sublimation chamber. And the problem was that I couldn't see what was going on with the ice cream inside there. So I ended up putting in too much heat, which I'll get into later, and the ice cream melted. So that didn't work. So I preferred to have a glass chamber. And I uh, made a specialized cork by uh, boring it out with a piece of copper pipe. And then I sweated on a flare fitting, which I can use to monitor the pressure. So the trick is that the, the line going to the pressure gauge can be quite small in diameter because it's not really flowing anything. The line from the cold trap to the chamber must be, again, quite large to, to make sure that enough water flows through there, even at these low pressures. The first step in this process is to make sure that the ice cream is really solidly frozen. 
So I modified a standard water cooler uh, by shorting or uh, bypassing its temperature sensor so that the compressor would run all the time. And then I filled it up with denatured alcohol and um, measured the temperature to see how cold it would get. And it would get down to about negative 25 Celsius, which was just short of the target. I was shooting for about negative 30 or even negative 35. I read in, in one of the patents that uh, any solution that has sucrose in it would need to be chilled below negative 30 degrees C for a, a complicated reason that I, I barely understand. But basically sucrose solutions, even though the pressure is low enough to sublimate water, will still have a structural change when you try to sublimate the thing just because of the high amount of sucrose in the solution. So anyway, so I was shooting for like negative 30 or negative 30 C. So what I did was I put the uh, flask in the uh, water cooler after loading it up with some ice cream. This is a Neapolitan Klondike bar and then added some dry ice to the uh, uh, to the water cooler to get it down below negative 30. So I left the flask in their atmospheric pressure with the ice cream in it at negative 30 for a little while to make sure that the ice cream was really that cold. I also added a bunch of dry ice to the thermos and uh, had a little bit of an overflow there. <laughs> Good thing there's no audio track on this one. So after getting the process started, uh, I realized that I could raise the temperature in the chamber uh, without melting the ice cream. And the reason that we can do this, uh, or apply heat to the chamber without melting the ice cream, uh, and the reason we can do this is that by um, lowering the pressure, the water molecules are, are transferring, are converting from solid to vapor, and they're taking heat with them. Uh, so this is known as a sublimation cooling. You might have also heard of evaporative cooling when, when the liquid changes to a vapor. So by pumping out all of the water, we're actually simultaneously cooling and drying the ice cream. Uh, the cooling effect is so large that we actually have to put in a lot of heat in order to make sure that the ice cream will fully sublimate in a reasonable amount of time. So commercial uh, freeze drying machines have heated shelves in them. So you freeze the product first, lower the pressure, and then heat them up, actually apply heat to it to make sure to drive off the water and make it go from solid to vapor. I took the flask out of the water cooler and then used two tungsten light bulbs to uh, radiate some heat in there. And I used light bulbs instead of just submerging it in a warm water bath because uh, there isn't a whole lot of conduction going on between the ice cream and the flask wall. Uh, it's really necessary to have a radiation, a radiative heater uh, to, to beam the heat through the glass onto the ice cream. And commercial freeze dryers have like heating elements, sort of like a space heater to, to radiate heat towards the food. So I set this up last night before going to bed and let it run overnight. And when I came in this morning, uh, there was a huge chunk of ice. The ice was even visible sticking out of the cold trap. And the pressure gauge was reading high, like higher than it can measure. So I thought I had lost it, but Somehow, luckily, this all worked out. And what had happened was is the, there was so much water extracted from the ice cream that the cold trap filled up. It was plugged. So I took it all apart and emptied the ice out of the cold trap and then put it back together and let it run for another eight hours today. So I had a total of about 18 hours of pumping. And I think that's more than enough. It probably was done sooner than that, but it's, it's kind of hard to tell. I should add that the chocolate was a problem. The chocolate doesn't freeze-dry. It stays uh, runny even even after all the water has been removed. It's probably because of the high fat content. So in the future, if I do this again, I would either use ice cream that has no chocolate on it or um, just do a better job of cutting it off. Of course, I had to do Neapolitan because, you know, it's astronaut ice cream. Here's a phase diagram for water. And so normally at atmospheric pressure, which is uh, what I'm showing with this dotted line here, your ice cream starts off solid, it's cold, and if you heat it up it eventually reaches this point here where it turns into a liquid. And if you keep heating it, like boiling it on the stove, it eventually becomes a vapor and the water will be gone and you'll be left with um, a sludge, basically all the components of ice cream that aren't water. But in this case what we're doing here is starting here again the ice cream's cold and it's at atmospheric pressure. And what we do is we lower the pressure, so moving down on the chart to here, then we start raising the temperature. So we go straight from solid to vapor. This, by the way, is the critical point. 
um, which I've talked about a little bit in some of my other videos, where the difference between liquid and vapor ceases to exist. So what you can do is, transfer, is go from liquid to vapor by going around this critical point, and you never have to transition through this line. So phase diagrams are pretty cool. I encourage you to look at these for other substances, and, and there's actually quite a bit more detail that I haven't included here, which is pretty interesting. Okay, well, I'm taking suggestions on what to freeze-dry next, so uh, put that in the comments, and I will see you next time. Bye.